Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 14th annual Design for Drupal Boston. For those of you who are new to Design for Drupal, this is an annual event devoted to Drupal design, UX, and front-end development, as well as the business and process challenges facing Drupal teams. Uh, we're typically an in-person event held every summer in Boston, Massachusetts, but in its place, we're holding monthly webinars in various Drupal design and front-end topics. We do, however, anticipate holding this year's event in person and we'll keep you posted as plans come together. Um, I'm currently speaking with venues uh, with availability in late July uh, or early August. Uh, right now we're leaning toward, we're waiting on final confirmation from a vendor for July 26th and 27th, I believe. That's the last Thursday and Friday in July. So more will be posted um, if that venue, um, you know, if we sign a contract with that venue, uh, hopefully that'll be within the next couple of weeks. Um, we are supported by a great team of volunteers, including Patrick Corbett, who is not able to make it today. He typically does the introductions. Uh, Catherine Carruthers, who handles our video recordings. Catherine Waldron, who manages our social media and mailings. Donna Bungard, who's handling our sponsorships. And Aubrey Sim Sambor, who uh, helps us with website support. Um, and I'm now going to go through a couple of slides. Um, the slide that, that I'm sharing right now has a QR code and a link to the slides that I'm going to be sharing with you. Uh, and there are a lot of links within those slides that you can refer to uh, after. All right, so today's webinar, our March 2023 webinar, the subject is what does it mean to have accessible and inclusive presentations? We're really um, excited to have Amy June Heinlein here. Amy June is the Senior Community Manager at opensource.com. Um, I've shared the Twitter and Amy June's Drupal.org links in the slides. So thank you, Amy June, for joining us. Um, the last, well, in June of 2022, we did hold a virtual event. Um, we had a keynote developing sustainable empathy systems with Sharon Steed. That was a very exciting keynote. There's a, there's a link here to the recording if you were not able to make that um, keynote last year. Uh, ongoing Drupal contributions is very important to the Drupal community. There's many, many, many opportunities to give back. Some of the Slack channels you can look at are on the Drupal Slack. You can go to project dash browser. Uh, contribution dash, dash events gives you some events that are happening both, both in person and virtually where you can contribute. Um, admin dash UI for the Claro theme, Drupal 9 dash theme for the Olivero theme. Um, and the most important thing is everybody's welcome to join. There are opportunities to contribute for any anything from design, designing logos, for instance, front end theming, code, documentation, testing, and very important based on today's talk, accessibility. So there's there's some a place for everybody to contribute. Um, there are mentors available on those different channels that I shared, and there's many other channels on Drupal Slack as well. Many opportunities for you to contribute and give back to the community. Our upcoming webinar series, I still don't have anybody locked in for April. Uh, we, we have either April 12th or 19th open to do the next webinar. So if you know somebody that's interested in speaking on something design or front end related, please reach out and let us know. Uh, May 17th, we have Justin Tupin and Ken Woodworth from Atten talking about Mercury Editor. It's a drag and drop Drupal publisher and how designers can benefit from using it. So that'll be a good talk in May. We are not gonna have a, a talk in June because that's when the North American DrupalCon is being held. So these two will be the last two in this, you know, our 14th year uh, webinar series. Drupal 10 was released back in November. There's a couple of things on the slide here that talk about, you know, the new things in Drupal 10. I'm not going to go through those, but just remember that uh, Drupal 9 is going to be end of life uh, in November. So you will need to be up, updating your sites to Drupal 10. And we'll have some, probably some webinars on some of these, you know, 
maybe Clara, the new theme, or Olivero, or CK Editor at five. We, we're going to try and get some more um, sessions at the in-person event and some more webinars after the fact on some of these new things that are in Drupal 10. Uh, community events. The next major community event is DrupalCon North America. It's in Pittsburgh, June 5th to 8th of this year. Early bird registration is currently open, and there are, there's a link on the bottom there too, where you can sign up to attend. DrupalCon Lille uh, is October 17th to 20. That is in Lille, France. I'm looking forward to that. That's a, a, more of an international um, event there. There's a lot of um, folks from, you know, across the globe that, that go to that event that might not have the opportunity to come to the North America DrupalCon. More locally, some of the community events coming up. Drupal Camp New Jersey is to, starting tomorrow, the 16th to the 18th. That's an in-person event in Princeton. March 17th to 19th, again, starting on Friday, is Nerd Summit. 2023, that's in Amherst, Massachusetts. That's in Western Massachusetts. That's an in-person event. April 26th to 28th is MidCamp. That's in the Chicago area. That is both online, virtual, and in-person. Uh, there's a Stanford web, web camp in May, May 11th and 12th. That's an online camp. July 7th to 9th is Drupal Camp Asheville. That's an in-person event. And as I said, we're trying to get designed for Drupal to be, uh, it will be an in-person event, hopefully the last weekend in July, the last Thursday and Friday in July. There is an events page on Drupal.org. It's Drupal.org slash community slash events. There are many, many camps and events that I did not mention, local meetups, trainings, contribution events that you can see on this page. And it is a lot of international events coming up like in this one that you can see you know there that was held in Japan but you can see all the different um, events that are happening because folks on this call might be from other areas so make sure you check out that page. Code of conduct. Um, the code of conduct applies to both in person and all these webinars and all these virtual events so there is a link to the Drupal code of conduct on the website on the design for Drupal. Um, website, so please check that out. Um, we want to make sure all attendees feel welcome and included. Um, and you know, we want to make sure we treat everybody with dignity and respect. So keep that in mind at this webinar and in all your interactions, whether they're Drupal or not. Reach out to myself or, well, Patrick's not here today, so reach out to me. Phone number is there, 908, the number four Drupal, if there's any issues at all. Okay, so our 15th anniversary of Design for Drupal, really exciting. That is coming up. That's this, this year. Uh, we are looking for some additional volunteer help. We are a nonprofit organization. It's all volunteer based. Would love to have somebody else help them with the event coordination. Uh, you know, we definitely need more help with social media, marketing, speakers, sponsors. So if you have any time, reach out to either myself or Boston at design the number four drupal.org. Even a little bit, even on-site help uh, volunteering would be would be very helpful to us. So please think about that. Uh, thank you to our gold digital sponsor, Redfin Solutions. Our the other digital sponsors, EPAM, Dev Collab, Atten, Elevated Third, Canopy Studios, Talking Drupal, 108 Degrees, and Pantheon. So thank you everybody for sponsoring, and we will be reaching out for sponsors for the in-person event and for this next year's webinar series. Uh, the, the hashtag the, um, D, the number four D Boston, uh, if you want to share anything about today's webinar on social media. The Q&A, uh, use the Q&A feature in Zoom to ask questions. We will uh, ask the questions at the end of the presentation and Amy June will be happy to, uh, to answer those. I think that's it. So. Um, we are excited to have Amy June here today. Amy June is the Senior Community Manager at opensource.com, a, a project that is supported by Red Hat. She's also a Drupal core mentor and co-organizes many, many things, including various open source camps and conventions globally. Uh, Amy's a self-described, Amy June is a self-described non-coder 
and she helps communities discover discover how they can contribute and belong in, in more ways than code, which I mentioned earlier, many, many ways to contribute. Amy June also helps organize Alley Talks, an online meetup that advocates for all things accessibility, one of the core components of building an inclusive web. And last but not least, Amy June was the 2021 recipient of the Aaron Winborn Award, presented annually to an individual who demonstrates personal integrity, kindness, and above and beyond commitment to the Drupal community. So congratulations, Amy June, on that award. Um, and today we're excited to have Amy June with us to talk about what it means to have accessible and inclusive presentations. So welcome back to Design for Drupal, Amy June. You were with us last year in March and you're with us this year in March. So we're excited about that. Uh, so I'll leave it up to you. So take it away. Thanks, Leslie, for the lovely um, introduction. Uh, so I'm talking about accessible um, and inclusive presentations today. And there's a couple of things that have come up this week that makes my presentation not 100% inclusive and accessible. So I just want to throw that out there. And when that happens, I'll let you all know, because um, I'm traveling. So there's some things that just always go wrong and you don't pack when you travel. Um, but I'm going to share my screen. And you all should see my title slide. Um, I'll do some housekeeping first. For brevity, um, there's a lot of images in my slide deck, but I won't be describing all of the images. Some of them are purely decorative, but the ones that um, add content, I'll be sure to describe. Um, I have a bit.ly link that I posted in the chat um, to, uh, for, a, sorry. Uh, a to post to my slide deck, but this is one of the inaccessible things is it's a Red Hat slide deck and it doesn't open up permissions. So what y'all ha will have to do is click on that link and then ask for permission. And then after the show, I'm gonna have to go back and give you permission. Not the most ideal thing, but that's what I have to work with today. Um, I don't need to, introduce myself again, but I do want to um, answer the question of who am I to talk about accessibility. Um, I am a hospice nurse by trade. I worked in hospice for over 30 years before I got into tech. So I understand that people have difficulties accessing digital assets, and I'm also disabled myself. I don't want to assume anyone's level of knowledge around accessibility, so I want to give a little bit of a brief interview of some terms and definitions and kind of break down the most important parts of accessibility. 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability. That's a lot of people, you know, that includes people you know, people are probably in the Zoom room with us. Um, and remember, as we get older, everyone becomes more disabled with time. There are uh, four types of disabilities listed up on the slide. The first one is temporary. You know, these are things like maybe you've had LASIK eye surgery and you're recovering and your screen needs to be dimmed. There are situational disabilities, you know, like maybe your batteries in your mouse have um, been stolen from a from you um, so a kid can play a video game, or maybe you're using a phone or a bright tablet in the bright sun. And then of course we have those permanent disabilities that people live with all of the time. And a new disability, or not new disability, but a new concept um, came up over the summer that I hadn't heard of before. I mean, I have because I'm a nurse, but it's called episodic disability. And this is a lifelong condition these are things like diabetes or HIV, cancer, you know, people living with episodic disabilities experience periods of fluctuating good health and ill health, um, and their needs are not consistent. Inclusion is not giving special privileges to people. It's about making sure that all of the barriers are removed for them. And for me, the word special privileges is, is a little troublesome. Um, 
these are basic human rights. There's nothing special about our needs as disabled people. Oh, uh, you might have heard of WCAG, that uh, some people call it WCAG or WCAG. It's um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and they're really there to normalize how we measure accessibility internationally. Um, it's developed with that in mind, just to have a single shared um, document that meets the needs of not only individuals, but organizations and governments. Um, and throughout the world, many countries, including the United States, reference these guidelines when they establish their own criteria. POUR, P-O-U-R, is an acronym um, for high-level principles that describe accessibility. Perceivable means that um, folks can identify content and interface elements by means of their senses. Operable, it means that a user can use buttons and controls and other interactive um, elements when necessary. We wanna make sure that users should be able to comprehend and understand the content and learn how to remember, learn and remember how to use the interface from page to page. And then the last one is robust. It really has to do with allowing users to interact with your websites, your documents, your multimedia, and any other you know, form of digital asset with whatever technology they choose. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, you should be able to choose the technology you interact with um, on, on your websites. So to break it down a little bit more, um, the CDC reports that approximately 12 million uh, folks 40 years and older in the United States live with some sort of vision loss. And that means, um, well, that's a lot of people and 1 million people who are blind. But again, there's other factors like cracked cell phones or, or you know, glare on the screen. So we wanna make sure that our products are easy to see so we accommodate visual needs. We wanna make sure that it e that our products are easy to hear, so we accommodate auditory needs. You know, when we address these needs, we help individuals who are in noisy environments as well as our uh, deaf and hard, and hard of hearing friends. This can take the form of captions, ASL interpreters, transcripts, we have folks who might live with a palsy, you know, a shake um, from something like Parkinson's, or perhaps they're paralyzed from an accident or from ALS. Um, so we wanna make sure that um, we accommodate motor needs um, and make things easy to interact with. And this can be a situational um, a disability of perhaps, you know, a young mother on a city bus where she's holding her child in one arm and she only has one other, her other arm for being on her cell phone and just the thumb for, uh, for scrolling. So that's a situational disability. And then the last one is we really want people to understand so accommodate cognitive needs. And this can include people who are distracted or have a difficult time focusing. And before I move into content, I wanna take a personal moment with y'all. Um, as a Quaker, I believe the wish for peace resides in all of us and the violence and war are never the only option. Um, so I invite you to hold in the light all of those in the Ukraine whose lives are in danger and disrupted by fear hold light for the refugees fleeing Ukraine and the Russians who are shocked and dismayed at the course of their government has taken, you know, the decision makers, the soldiers, and all those courageously working for peace. Thank you. Okay, moving into content, you know, we're here for accessible presentations. First, we'll talk a little bit about layout. Make sure you're creating your slides for the right screen size. Um, try to find out in advance what aspect ratio the projector will have. We wanna make sure that we stay away from the edges of the screen. Um, just to be safe, you know, keep key information out of those areas. And then remember to save room for captions. And I talk about captions later on in the presentation. 
give your slides a theme. It could be that you illustrate all your points with low cats or um, that all that you use the same background and topography, whatever it is, having a visualized a, a visually unified deck makes a big difference for people um, that remembering and interacting with your slide deck, you know, from slide to slide. Um, many speakers end up with a with a look to their slides that they stick with from presentation to presentation, and that's great. And it makes their talk stand out, and it makes it feel like a cohesive set. Um, in the picture here, you can see that I have um, a PowerPoint set of slides um, that are all kind of unified. There's a couple of different uh, layouts available, but they but they all have the same theme. Page numbers, um, include page numbers when you can. Um, include page numbers in the same spot on your slides if possible, because page numbers allow users to coordinate where they are in the presentation. Um, it can be too much to try to explain you know, it's easier to say slide 16 than to try to explain the slide after the layout slide. Um, so keep your keep uh, page numbers in a consistent location. Make sure your slide has unique headers or titles. Um, if there is more than one slide on the same topic, and you saw, you see this, I have. Um, several slides that say slide layout, but then they're unique because I'm talking about specifics. Um, if there's more than one slide on the same topic, you know, um, perhaps add a numerical identifier to the header, like, you know, header one of two, or do something like this where I had one slide that says slide layout unique titles, and then the last one says, you know, slide layout page numbers. And you can see in this um, image, there's four slides there with very clear and different header titles. The order a screen reader reads a slide contents is important. Um, when you think about a word processing document, the reading order is natural as the content is generally proceeds, you know, from left to right and from top to bottom. And I'm talking more about, you know, uh, English here, but, um, you know, left to right, top to bottom. On a slide, however, content is added in separate text boxes that can be created and edited in any order. Sometimes the headers are at the bottom of the slide, but the intention is that they should be re read first. Imagine how confusing the content would become if, you, if it was read out of order. And here's a, a little chart of um, cards um, with orange arrows that describe the reading order. You can see they're going left to right, um, going back down, um, back to the left, and then to the right, and then back down to the, to the left. So here's an example of a slide with the same heading, um, moving into some slides with the same headings, um, break up the content one of five. Not a not a super creative way to do it, but these are just examples of how to make your slides more accessible. Um, this slide, I want to talk about having really text heavy slides. We want to avoid that, you know, avoid text heavy slides. Large blocks of text look like that look like wall to wall words are barriers to some folks. <clears throat> you want to use visual and semantic space. Space is an important visual design tool that helps us identify groups of content and delineate unrelated content. So um, non-visual users benefit from space that's created um, using semantic markup as well. And you can see this is a, a page out of a book where you know it's just uh, loads and loads of text. Um, use headings. Headings make up the structure of our web content. They improve readability. They help users instantly know what the content is about, and it even helps with SEO. But headings also give folks an exit and entry point if they look away or are distracted. So just now in the hallway, I'm in a hotel, the woman uh, started the vacuum cleaner, so I looked away. But with a great 
with the with the headings the way they are, I know exactly where I am in the slide deck. And here's a image of um, how headings are are nested um, when we create content. Another way to break up our content is to use bullet points. Um, if you're working with a list, <clears throat> break that list up into bullet points. This makes it easier for people to scan and read, and it's a way to break up text and make it more visually appeal appealing. Um, for folks who might be using assistive technology, breaking up the content into numbered or bulleted lists will help assistive technology users navigate and understand the items on the list. And this is an, an image out of um, PowerPoint of uh, editors uh, options for bullet points. So this is numbering your list. Numbering your list makes it more readable as well. You know, your audience can scan and make sure that they've read every tip you're offering in your post. Um, numbering headings isn't just for list posts though. It's helpful when you're writing a how-to post. Readers can be sure that they haven't accidentally scrolled past a step. So this is much like bullet points, you know, those are unordered lists and this is an ordered list. So you can see, you know, one, two, three, and four. When we use our editors, um, we have lots of different options that we can choose and not all of them are um, built with accessibility in mind. Um, we wanna avoid formatting our content in our slide decks with center justification. Keep it to the right or to the left for readability. Left or right aligned text is easier to read than centered text for paragraphs. This is because when you center your text, the starting point of each line changes. Um, this really forces us to work harder to find where each line begins when we continue reading. And without a straight left edge, um, there's no consistent place where users can move their eyes when they complete the line as well. And this is an image of the button to, to center justify your text in Google Slides. Don't write out what you are going to be saying. This can be a flexible rule or useful, important quotes, but nobody likes anyone reading lines from a slide. So break up your content. You know, what, what you have on your slides are, are, are the main points and you elaborate when you're, when you're giving the talk, but no one wants to hear you um, read the entirety of your slide deck. Moving into topography. We really want to limit the use of multiple fonts. We want to be consistent. It can be distracting for viewers when we switch between different fonts all the time. Um, up here is an image of New York written in many different um, fonts. You want to take care when selecting those limited fonts. Um, we don't want to use a fancy font that's cute but unreadable. Um, we want to select basic, simple, easily readable fonts. Um, in the image here, this is a fancy font. And I, it's a part of a bigger sentence, um, but you know, it's got the children playing around with the, you know, their, their hands and their legs. And it's just really makes it unreadable. We want to avoid small fonts. We want to use relative units for our font sizes like M's and REMs. Um, Modern browsers can smoothly zoom pixel-based layouts, you know, sizing type and relative units really ensures that the entire layout can be scaled up or down by simply updating the font size on the body element. It design should allow topography to be maximized, magnified up to 200% without the user, without clipping, or without distorting the content, you know, making it pixelated. A good rule for slide content is um, to use 20 to 28 points and for the headers aim for 36 to 44. And don't rely on the appearance of the font, um, you know, the color, the shape, 
the font variation, the placement to convey meaning. Um, you can see up here, uh, or maybe you can't because the font is small. Um, we have the word sponsored contributions, super, super small. Imagine you're in a in a in-person conference, you know, and you have, you know, you're in the keynote and there's people in the back of the room, they won't be able to see that sponsored contribution text. So more topography considerations. Um, well, this is more content than topography. Um, acronyms, abbreviations, and numerums. Um, what are they? You know, first, an acronym is a word or a name consisting of parts of the full names words. Um, up here, I have the acronym um, Black Lives Matter. I have it spelled out first and then um, the acronym behind it in abbreviations. And you really want to make sure that you define the acronym before you use it. And then after you have that definition up there, you can use the acronym at will. Um, same rule applies for abbreviations. Um, we don't want to assume that people know your specific acronym or abbreviations. You know, I do have BLM up here, but, you know, BLM to my grandfather is Bureau of Land Management, while BLM to my generation is Black Lives Matter. Abbreviations are shortened from the word or phrases. Um, well, I have... Okay, so this is wrong. Um, this is my first time giving this slide deck and you know how you always find wrong things as you're going through it. I have as soon as possible up there as an abbreviation, but that's an acronym, ASAP. But abbreviations are short versions of the word. You know, again, if you use abbreviations, make sure you define it. Um, numerems, this is using the first and the last letter of a word. Um, accessibility, we have the A and the Y and the number 11 to identify the number of characters used in between the two when we spell them out. So it's A11Y for accessibility. And then, you know, some of us work on the web. We often hear internationalization um, spelled out as I18N. You know, there's the I and the N with 18 letters um, missing um, in between. All caps can be troublesome. Um, this decreases the readability as now the word has no shape and is just a rectangular. So avoid using all caps when you can. Um, it's really, the readability is really reduced because all of them have that rectangular uniform shape, meaning that readers can't identify words by their shape. We wanna be inclusive of dates, um, especially in an international audience. When we have the month, day, and year separated by a hyphen or a backstroke, it can be confusing as Americans use the month, day, year format where everyone else is, uses the day, month, year. So I suggest the format of using the, the day, spell out the month, and then the year. You see I have the numeral three, March, 2023, and it avoids confusion. Um, and remember, we're on a global stage, so include time zones you know, um, that way people can translate it into their own um, time zones. Camel case, your hashtags. Um, screen readers cannot identify the individual words in a hashtag without camel case. Having all lowercase just muddles the meaning and it's unclear to everyone. Um, I have one up here. Um, one I like to, to give an example of is now, Thatcher is dead. Well, when it was all lowercase, um, some folks thought it read now that Cher is dead. So without that clarity of the uppercase, um, it, can, it can be confusing. Numbers. Um, there's lots of schools of thought around numbers and how we display them. So if you have a style guide that you work with for your organization, stick to your style guide. But please take into account people who, who live with this calcula. It's estimated that between three and 6% of the population have a form of this. This is marked by having difficulties with counting or visualizing numbers, um, simple math. Uh, it could be in uh, accurate interpretation of numbers when reading or copying and writing and reasoning and speaking and recalling. Um, I've always been told to spell out 
one through 10 in most in instances. Of course, there's exceptions. You know, even on this slide deck, I use the number three in my date format. Use of color. We love color. So really consider your choices of color. There are tools online that you can check for color contrast um, to be sure that it's easily readable. And some of the um, some of the WCAG guidelines are changing and some of the WCAG guidelines don't make sense. Like I've put numbers in where I've played with like putting in the foreground and the background. I'm like, that, I can't see that. So just because it passes a guideline doesn't make it usable. So really take into account the, your choice of colors. Um, and again, relying on color alone to communicate information causes barriers. Um, Colorblind and low vision folks may not be able to perceive the color differences and screen readers do not announce when colors do not announce colors to non uh, sighted readers. And there are some rules around the use of color with links and i'll go over that in another slide, but in this picture, you can see there's uh, uh, four different colors we've got what is it like black on yellow. White on purple green on red and dark blue on green. And you can see how some of those um, color contrasts are a little bit easier to use than others. Um, there are different forms of um, color blindness. And you know, one of the more common ones is red and green. So try to avoid red and green um, color combinations. Images. I love images. I give a whole talk on, on like images. I give a whole talk on alt text. They are my favorite thing because they really enhance and add emotion and flavor to content. Um, so make sure that you describe images and videos out loud for folks who might not visually see the images. You know, I've been doing that to some of the images as I've been going along. Um, but do that, especially if the images add value or meaning or provide more context. How would you describe this image? That's really up to you. Um, the same image can have different meaning depending on how it's being used. Um, I could maybe say that this is a herd of zebras and leave it at that. Simple, succinct, that's what it is, a herd of zebras. But I could also say that it's a herd of zebras drinking the last water of the season. So it depends on how you're using it and what emotion or what context you need um, to add. Complex images. We wanna avoid presenting images of complex charts and tables. We wanna make our graphics in our slide decks as simple as possible. No one wants to read a complicated graphic when there's only a few important things about it. You know, save that complicated graphic for your paper or for your article afterward. Um, on this screen, there's a couple of different charts. Um, much of the color is inaccessible, but I just wanted to demonstrate that there's a lot of information on this in this image for someone to take when they're sitting, you know, watching your presentation. In Google Slides and many of the other slide, um, uh, slide creation tools. Um, you can right click on the image and add alt text. So this is an image of me doing that. Um, you can see that there's two fields. There's the title field and the description field. Um, don't have the title and the alt field be the same because as a screen reader announces it, it's redundant for those listening on assistive technology. We wanna use code sparingly. You know, it's hard to sit through pages and pages of code. Um, use only what you need and make it readable. Um, you know, uh, lots of folks will have code up on their presentations that's so small or some of the color combinations don't work. So just make sure that it's readable and then break it into smaller chunks if you need to. And as a side note, um, you know, when I share the slide deck, Right now, you wouldn't be able to copy and paste this because it's an image. So if you, if you do use code, use code blocks and then people are able to copy and paste them instead of having to you know, uh, translate it from um, a screenshot. Sound, this is an important one to me because I'm hard of hearing. Um, Zoom, 
is nice. Zoom um, has built-in captions, but I'll show at the end how you can uh, create captions in, in Google Slides yourself. But when you're in a room full of people, um, use the microphone. You know, I get to some conferences and someone will have a big boomy voice and they think that that's enough and that's what they'll use. But really, you should stand up and ask the question, can you hear me in the back of the room? And use the microphone. You know, um, one of the things, um, one a polite thing to do is when people ask you questions, repeat the questions in the microphone so others in the room can hear the question. But it also is nice for the folks watching the video afterward that they can hear the question and not just the answer. And here I have a an image of a Doberman Pinscher um, singing into a microphone. Going back to that, make it easy to hear, address auditory needs, um, make transcripts and captions available. Um, at the end, because I don't know how to switch back and forth into slide present mode, I'll show, I'll show you all how to create captions in Google Slides. But some venues will have live captioning um, or ASL interpreters. Um, and like I said, Google Slide now has live captioning. Um, then to account for that, what I try to do is I leave um, a section of the bottom of my slide empty. So when uh, the videos are uploaded onto YouTube, YouTube the, the captions don't obscure the content. You know, So keep your content above that like uh, four-fifths line. Here we have Doctor Who um, talking into uh, her cell phone, um, and the caption says, tell me about visual language of closed captions in subtitles. So some more considerations. Um, this uh, one I am guilty of not doing. Um, <laughs> It's nice to provide the slide links ahead of time. Again, I have the slide links, but um, I had permission issues. So be sure to ask me for permission and I'll open those up. But when you give people your slides ahead of time, it gives them access to the links, but it also gives them time to formulate questions ahead of time. Or maybe um, it gives the, the organizers a chance to share your slides with um, the captioners, so the captioners become familiar with the technology. Um, here I have a, a, the paper plane icon that we use for mail um, up against a brick wall. Links. Links, not only in our web page content, but in our slides should not be indicated by color alone. If your links are not underlined, they, there needs to be two designators. Um, and that means um, if your link is not underlined, you can have it be a different color, but have it be a heavier font. That way people can distinguish it between the, the, the typeface around it. Um, and then have descriptive links, you know, and really uh, just underline your links. You know, Craigslist kind of got it right the first time, you know, underline those links. Everyone knows that underlining link, un that an underlined word is a link. Transitions and animations. Um, we want to address visually induced motion sickness. Sometimes you'll see this as VIMS, V-I-M-S, visually induced motion sickness. We want to avoid rapid slide transitions and rapid flashing lights and rapid animations. Animated backgrounds back here for me um, and parallel effects can be problematic. Um, if we have GIFs or GIFs, I don't know how to say that one. Um, they can be a distraction, especially if they're left on the slide for any long amount, amount of time. Um, you know, it will always be kind of flashing for some people and that'll be so distracting they won't actually hear the content that's being presented. Um, and some types of rapid motions and patterns can induce seizures. So fade or peer animations are acceptable, but really avoid that flashing and flying text. And adjust your screen size, you know, bump up the text and the cursor size. Um, also, this is for when you're screen sharing or doing a demo. You wanna avoid words like this, that, 
there, and see. When we use these words heavily, it's likely that you're relying on the participant's ability to see what you see at the time that you're seeing it. So to combat that uh, dependence on words like here, um, there's a formula. It's account or action, name, location, and description. So the location is describing the location of the actions on the screen, and it can really help participants keep track of where you're, where you're at on the screen. And then the description describe important or unique characteristics of an element that will make it easier to find on the screen. And again, those are for screen sharing and um, demos. It would be a disservice if I didn't talk a little bit about user agents. Um, uh, what are user agents? These are how we interact with the web. This is um, assistive technology. Sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as AT. It's any device, software, or equipment that helps people work around challenges they have when learning and communicating and functioning on the web. Um, and remember, some folks will be accessing your slides after the audio presentation. So what tools will they be using? Screen readers, you know, these are used to listen to the content of the page. Um, they convert text to speech. You know, right here, there's a, a laptop with a set of headphones. Screen magnification is true to its name. It's used to enlarge the screen uh, content. So it's easier for people who live with partial sight or low vision. Keyboard navigation, um, you know, that order that we talked about, the, the flow of order. Um, we wanna create the same experience as someone that has that typical mouse interaction. So these next few examples really kind of apply to web pages, but complex menus, sliders, dialogues, tab panels, the interaction, needs to be presented in an intuitive and predictable way. And you can do that when you format your slides. And then a couple more um, alternative input devices that you can look up on your own. Um, people have head pointers, they have motion tracking or eye tracking, single switch entry devices, large print and tactile keyboards and speech input software. Um, the image up here is a refreshable braille display. And what that does is, is it provides access to information on a computer screen by raising and lowering pins in braille. Um, and a braille display can show up to 80 characters on the screen. It's about the same as when you have captions. Okay, we're presenting this um, uh, over the internet. So um, I wanna talk about content delivery platforms. These are user agents. Um, we have things like Hopin and Zoom, Jitsi, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, I'll just use Meets because that's what um, I use at Red Hat on the opensource.com team. And so here's the icon for Google Meets. You can see, you know, all of our faces are there. Um, I'm able to look at lips because I sometimes read lips to reinforce the content. Um, my, my toolbar is there, very doable. But what if I need captions? And I do. So now what happens is the captions pushes everybody up a little bit, right? There's not an, there, it takes up some of the real estate. Um, the captions only stay on the screen momentarily, but it's doable. But it's a meeting. So what's a meeting without someone sharing their screen? You know, so now we have our meetup, we have captions, and now someone's screen sharing. Now you can see that with our faces up there, with the captioning taking up almost a third of the real estate, that slide deck that's being presented is super, super small. It's really hard if you're on a small iPad or a 13 inch laptop to really know what's going on in that slide. And now people are chatting in the text box and some faces don't show up and now lip reading is out of the question. So you see when people, people have to really evaluate the tools that they use because you never know what part of the technology people need to use. And have you ever had someone describe you as an edge case. I did once in a meeting when I said I can't see the, the slides because of the captions being up. 
when you call something an edge case, you're really just defining the limits of what and who you care about. And I'll say that again. Um, when you call something an edge case, you're really defining the limits of what and who you care about. And I'm almost done because I see where the, the, the hand on the clock is in, inching up. Um, so some considerations for when you're presenting virtually. <clears throat> Describe the images like I've been doing. Wear headphones, which I should be doing because there's a lot of noise around me, but I did not pack headphones on my trip. Um, have the camera on. This helps folks who might need to read lips to reinforce the content. Avoid um, virtual and moving backgrounds behind you because that's some that can induce um, uh, motion sickness. And really um, provide that alternative text for folks, um, not only on images, but on graphs and charts and things like that. Um, and then to really you know, help us with our people, with our friends who have cognitive um, challenges. For the conclusion, you need, you would like to summarize what's been discussed. You know, we talked about slide layout, accessible content, user agents, virtual and in-person presentations. You want to review the main takeaway points. This reminds folks of what they just learned. And then really, you know, answer that so what question. Why does your topic matter? and give further resources that may be useful to attendees. Um, and then, you know, be sure to give your contact information for, you know, when you run out of time for Q&A or people have questions. Um, include a slide at the end of the deck to thank your audience. And you can use this as a closing slide to remind you to do your Q&A too. So um, again, here's my information, but I have one last slide. I do have a slide for additional resources. Um, they are links. So like I said, um, if you go to that uh, bit.ly link I shared at the beginning of the chat, which is bit.ly slash D for D dash A one one Y dash presentations, um, I'll open up permissions and then you can um, uh, have access to these links. So um, any questions? We have a couple minutes left. Uh, hi, yeah, we had a couple of questions. Um, one of them I you pretty much went through. What is assistive technology uh, that you mentioned on slide 22? And you had some later slides about that. Um, but another one is, do you have any suggestions of tools to check color contrast? We're especially challenged to assess color, adding in the considerations of font weight and size. Okay, so there's one called um, Web Contrast Analyzer, and um, it's put out through W3C Schools. Um, I use that in conjunction with an eyedropper tool I have on my toolbar. I take the eyedropper and I select the color and it tells me what the what the code is for it. And then I drop it into the web contrast analyzer tool. And what's nice about this tool is it asks you for the foreground and the background, and then it gives you different success criteria. Like if you're using it at this font, it's accessible. If you're using it in your graphical user interface, it's accessible. If you're using it for heavier font, it's accessible. So it gives you three success criteria to choose from. And there's a bunch of different ones out there, but the one from W3C schools is the one I like the most. Okay. And I just wanted to say like so much of this uh, aside from presentations is also, um, you know, in our day-to-day -day work designing and developing websites, uh, we need to keep all of these things in mind also. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah. We have a few more minutes. Oh, okay. Um, in the Q&A, uh, just a comment. Nice presentation, Amy June. This is great information. Um, yeah, I work at Massachusetts. Okay, so this is Michael Sanders um, at Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. And he's helping individuals with disabilities get back to work. 
Oh, one thing I want to show real quick, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen again, is turning on captions um, in Google Slides, because lots of folks don't know that that's a thing. So y'all should see my thank you slide. Is that right? Yep. yep. Okay. So if I scroll down here, of course, the Zoom toolbar is in the way, but there's this little slot down here in the left-hand corner. And I hit these three dots and I go to, oh, the Zoom toolbar is in the way again. Okay, I hit the three dots. I go to caption preferences. I pick text size. I pick large because if, if I'm in a room and people are way in the back, large is a good size. And then I put text position top because that way the captions are at the top so people don't have to look around people's heads. And then I just toggle them on. And now what happens is there are captions at the beginning of the slides. So if your venue doesn't have captions, you can provide captions for your audience. Um, they're not perfect, they are AI, but they are better than, than not having them. And another reason I put them on the top is because when the videos get translated into YouTube, the YouTube captions are at the bottom and these are now recorded and they're open captions at that point because you can't toggle them on and off. So think about that too, when you use them, they're open captions, so you can't turn them on and off. So, but I love that knowing that it's available. Okay, no. um, another question I had personally was, do you have, um, like you've used Google Slides to create this presentation, is that your favorite um, presentation software because of the accessibility features? It is. It is. It's very intuitive. Most stuff is right click, you know, um, most of the things that you're doing, um, it's easily shared. You know, most people have the fonts. So when you share it and they download it into a PDF, it doesn't get lost. You know, some of those more complicated are great, but. They, they don't have the accessibility built in and you really have to work on making them accessible and like learn the tool where Google is just kind of there and the buttons are there and there's not a whole lot to think about, you know, just point and click a couple of times and you've got it down. But I like it just because it, so many people use them. It's easy to share, you know, it's easy to, to copy it. And, and um, yeah, I don't like PDFs either. So that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I wanted to thank you, Amy June. This was a, a wonderful presentation. I learned so much. I do a lot of these, um, you know, presentations at camps and Drupal conferences and such. So I will try to take all your suggestions in my, you know, put them all in practice. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to come and share all your knowledge with us. It was it was an excellent presentation. So thank you. Thanks for having me, Leslie. Yep. And thanks for everybody who attended. And we'll look forward to uh, seeing you next month. Uh, this re this um, will be added to YouTube, this presentation, and we will be putting a link to it in the um, designfordrupal.org website. So check back there and you'll be able to get links to everything. Okay, thank you so much and we'll see everybody next month.